Could you please welcome to the stage Dr David Hayward. Cheers. I, they, they need a drink holder for this. Uh, so hopefully um, a, a, a slide is going to come up on this, um, on this screen at some point because I, I, I haven't really uh, got a prepared speech. I'm just, I'm just improvising to the slides. And if I... Ah, oh, oh, thank God. What a relief. Um, so, yes, this is uh, Russell's kind of... Um, alluded to what I'm talking about, but it's the sort of topic that needs uh, a few background details, so I'll give them to you before I get into the, the main body of the presentation. Uh, of course, you, as you know, I work for Public Address, uh, but I also am the science correspondent for Radio New Zealand um, on, the, on the 9 to Noon uh, program. That's because uh, I, at one stage I, I was a scientist. And it's very interesting to me to compare and contrast the audiences for the two organisations. As, as Russell's mentioned, the, um, the public address audience is obviously very highly intelligent and well healed, but also a very, very nice, uh, loving group of people who would, um, almost without exception, it seems to me, do, do it, almost anything for you. And this was really brought home to me at the last Great Blend, where I received a three-way hug of love from, um, from Emma Hart, who you just saw, and the, the famous Megan with the giant cleavage, and uh, Craig Renapia. And... Uh, in some ways, in some ways it, was a, it took a bit of getting used to because I had, I had on the one hand, uh, Megan and, and, and Emma's magnificent cleavages pressing against my body and then Craig Renapia's bow tie sticking into my ear and his stubbly cheek re re rubbing against mine. And as a, as, I think as human beings, we've evolved. Uh, our expectations of hugs have evolved in that you only expect there to be either, either a magnificent cleavage or stubble, but not both at the same time. So in a, in, a lot, in a lot of ways, I'm still recovering from the trauma of that hug. But the, the, the intent to do good was there, the intent to share the love around, which is very much what public address is all about. In contrast, Radio New Zealand, I think the average Radio New Zealand listener, in my experience, is an ugly, hate-filled psychopath. And is, whenever I do, I do this interview slot on 9 to noon, my inbox immediately fills up with death threats. And it's... <laughs> It's extremely disconcerting. And that's just from Matthew Houghton, yes, as Craig Renapi says. Um, and, uh, and, and I have... And I'm going somewhere with, with this um, to explain the, 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 the topic that I'll be talking about. It's come out of the relationship that I have with Radio New Zealand, which is a very problematic relationship. And the most problematic bit of the relationship, um, I'm sorry to say, is Catherine Ryan, who's the host of Nine to Noon. And I know what everyone's thinking. You can't be mean about Catherine Ryan. She's an icon uh, and a lovely person. And she is a, a lovely, uh, you know, a talented broadcaster and a lovely, kind person while she's broadcasting. But as soon as that microphone is off, she, like her audience... Is, uh, is angry, is prone to violent mood swings, and, you know, in my opinion, my medical opinion as a doctor, a borderline sociopath. <laughs> and so that's difficult to work with. And uh, the other thing, which is kind of even, even more difficult for me, is that in my first, at least in my first, my initial analysis of the situation, is that she's profoundly uninterested in science. And when, as the science correspondent, this, is, this presents quite a challenge. And I'm often reminded, I think our interviews more or less work out like uh, those, uh, you know, when you're at a party and there's a pretty girl at the party and then the geeky science guy goes up and tries to impress her by talking about paleontology. And she's just like, at everything he says. And that's pretty much exactly the way our, way our interviews go. <laughs> and <laughs> it's hard going. And I, I've really tried to pull out the stops. I think there must be something in science, in the whole world of science, that interests Catherine Ryan. Uh, Oh, volume. Didn't expect that. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things I talked about was, uh, was this behind me, Project Orion, which was a, a giant 4,000-ton atom bomb-powered pogo stick that they were planning to launch into space in the 1960s. And I thought, no one can fail to be interested in this, but not a flicker of interest from Catherine. And, and I, was just, I, I, had to, I was pondering it afterwards and thinking, what is it? And I was, maybe, it's the, maybe it was the atom bombs. Maybe she wouldn't... She didn't think it was environmentally friendly. And so I, I, um, I if we come up. So the next, the next week I talked about uh, what's behind me now. Um, 
it's carbon nanotubes. They just developed very long lengths of carbon nanotubes, which could actually be used to build a space elevator. So you could take a lift from the surface of the Earth into space. And I thought, well, this surely must interest Catherine. And when she introduced the segment, she said, and David Hayward's going to talk about space science again. <laughs> and it was really hard to continue after that again. It was a very, very brutal again. And then, the, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm turning against Catherine Ryan here, but the other problem I have with Catherine Ryan <laughs> is this. Now, this is her photo as seen on the Radio New Zealand website. And I don't know if any of you noticed this. It's a very, very small photo indeed. <laughs> and as soon as I saw this photo, um, it made me think, what are they hiding? Uh, what's wrong with Catherine what, Ryan that they don't want us to know about? And I guess I just leapt to the, to the obvious conclusion which is that, that Catherine Ryan is a self-mutilator. And so what's happened is they've been about to take, they've been about to take her photo and they've, they, their attention has wandered for a second and she's picked up a, a broken glass or a knife and slashed her face and then they've stitched her up and they've, they've sponged the blood off but still it, would, it was just going to be glaringly obvious in the photograph and so they've had to make it really, really small on the website. And so this, was an added, this is an added layer of difficulty because <clears throat> not only am I imagining I'm just boring her shitless when I'm talking about my science, but also in order to cope with it, she's probably got a razor blade and is cut, cutting her, her arms or, and her legs. And um, uh, this has really preyed on my mind. But happily, I had to do one of the segments from the Auckland studio, and they had this giant photo of Catherine Ryan on the wall, which I described at the time as Gaddafi-esque. And... Um, <laughs> I had a really good look at that photo, and any of the bits that are visible, no scarring. So it was just a huge relief to me. It was at least one thing I didn't have to worry about. But it's funny the way these things work. <coughs> um, I was intensely relieved for a couple of days, and then I just got to thinking, why do they only show a picture of her from the front? Why not a picture from the back? What's wrong with Catherine Ryan's back that they're trying to hide? And, uh, you know, it, took, it actually took me an embarrassingly long time to figure it out, but... Uh, you know, obviously uh, a hunch. And I, don't want to, I, know I have to make it clear at this point, I have nothing at all against uh, people with hunchbacks. Uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's that it puts me in an impossible financial position as a science journalist, because I get paid an appearance fee to be on Radio New Zealand, and yet, and thank God, I haven't, I haven't let on that I know about this yet, so they haven't officially told me. But as soon as they do, I'll be in this impossible financial position because if you're being interviewed by a hunchback, you can't possibly take the appearance fee. You have to say, look, Catherine, just take the money you're going to pay me and, and put it towards some liposuction on your hump. And, and then, basically, you just don't make any money. You, all, all my hard science research is just going to feed the hump, as it were, or at least to feed the cosmetic surgeon who does the liposuction on the hump. So this is it's one of the, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away in, in the, in the self-mutilation versus hunchback uh, stakes. And then the, what I think is really the worst problem, and this isn't entirely Catherine Ryan's fault, is this guy. Po <laughs> Pollard. This is Simon Pollard, Professor Simon Pollard, <laughs> my nemesis, who does the science slot in the opposite week from me. And, you know, I said that my, my initial interpretation was that Catherine Ryan, Ryan was bored by science, but, but it turns out, tragically, no. When, when Pollard's on, it's like a love fest. She's like, oh, Simon, you're so interesting. Oh, Simon, your voice is caressing me like warm honey. And it's, it's really soul-destroying for me. And if, if you imagine the, the party where there's the pretty girl and I'm the science geek, Simon's like the captain of the first 15 who comes in and goes, hey, babe, is this guy bothering you? And, and, and then, uh, you know, the pretty girl goes, oh, Simon, you're so strong. And that's pretty much what happens, uh, you know, alternate week, weeks on Radio New Zealand. And it's really emotionally traumatic for me. And the worst thing is, is that I, not, I, can, I don't blame Catherine Ryan for it at all. He is, he is much better than me. I mean, he's fascinating. You can't help but be gripped by his science stuff. And if I wasn't on, I would actually write in a letter to complain about myself and say, look, get this guy off and let's have Simon Pollard on all the time because he's fantastic. And anyway... Um, I guess this led me to, uh, I thought, oh, look, I'll just resign. I can't, I can't handle this anymore. It's just way too emotional for me. And then I thought, no, no, you know, through strength, uh, you know, through adversity comes strength or vice versa. And um, I'll, 
what I'll do is I'll rise to the occasion. And so I decided that I was going to, taking a leaf from certain US politicians, I was going to, I was going to go maverick and I would present maverick science. The science that other science journalists dare not uh, report on. So I've done things like, uh, I, I reported on this disease, hot cheese face, which is a disease whereby if you eat cheese, your face gets hot. It, it's, it's not much of a disease, but it was all I had that week. Um, non chorophobia Many of you um, probably suffer from chorophobia, which is an irrational fear of clowns. non chorophobia is a rational fear of clowns. And if you follow that map of you... <laughs> Catherine Ryan, whenever I try and bring this up on the, on the national program, she always shuts me up. She doesn't want me to talk about this. But if you follow that map on the right-hand side of the screen, the red line, a typical case of chorophobia, they fear that clowns with their gigantic flipper feet will swim out of Waitemata Harbour and in between um, Great Barrier Island and Coromandel Peninsula, down the west coast of New Zealand, into Littleton Harbour, crossing over the bridal path and then going into the house of, of the sufferer, killing them in their own bed, filling their bath with acid and then dissolving their lifeless corpse uh, in, in their own bath. So it's, it's, but that's not an irrational fear. That's a rational fear. It's like you can't be scared of sharks because sharks will really kill you. I mean, you can't have, you can be scared of sharks, but you can't be irrationally fearful of sharks. And this is the, same, the same goes with killer clowns. This, you, can't be a, you can't be irrationally fearful of them because you should be scared of them. Um, and the most popular topic I did was the dilemma of the Gracewood sisters, which is uh, basically a scientific investigation into which of the Gracewood sisters you would rescue if they were drowning in shark-infested water. <laughs> and that's a very difficult scientific problem because you know, they're, they're both very attractive women. Uh, anyway, the maverick science has led me uh, to... to <laughs> I'm now staggering across the starting line into my presentation here. Uh, talking about pat uh, the patterns that exist in nature. And, of course, the very most famous pattern that exists in nature is behind me now, the snowflake. But there's another famous pattern in nature which has received much less scientific attention than the snowflake, and that is the cranial diameter in New Zealand Ministers of Finance since 1975. Now, I said that I, I was going to... I, I, that I like to report on the science that other people dared not uh, talk about. But in this case, that's not entirely true. I've... I've stood on the shoulders of giants. There's been a couple of brave pioneers who have gone ahead before me, blazing the trail uh, on this topic. Uh, the first one was uh, in 1985. Um, this was a, a master's thesis in public administration by Shane Jones. Uh, of course, he's now much more famous as an MP. And if I had to boil down his thesis into two words, those two words would be big heads. That's what, uh, that's what he concluded about the head size in New Zealand Ministers of Finance since 1975. It's pretty difficult. Can you see right down the bottom of the screen there the date? Uh, it's 1985, and that's the problem I have with this. So by 1985, there'd only been two Ministers of Finance since 75. so he was basing his whole thesis on just two data points, which I, I don't think was very scientifically rigorous. Six years later, there was a report by the uh, Business Roundtable uh, into the, the same topic, uh, and if I had to boil this down, I always like the business round table. They, they get such a lot of information out. Uh, volume 2982 by December 1991. Um, 